you want your kids to look up to what you're doing. I mean, that's what they learn. They learn from people that they respect yeah. and you want them to respect you. And, and you, you, the best dads are the ones where the kids are like, I want to be like dad. Mm-hmm. Well, if dad is just dad, that, that's hard to be. I just want to be like dad. Cause all dad does is like sit there and, and take care of me. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't teach me anything. This show is dedicated to helping you strengthen your family tree and live financially free. Welcome to the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast, everybody. This is session number 93. Today, I have a special guest on the show today, everybody, Mark Beauvert. Mark is the co-host of The Drink Podcast. His show focuses on everything from sports, current events, and of course, personal development, one of my faves. (laughs) Mark is a single father of three who hails from the great state of Michigan, just like me. I personally really enjoy his conversations and perspective around fatherhood, balancing work with a pursuit of your passions, and then discovering who you really are as a man. So welcome to the show, Mark. Hey, thanks for having me. Excellent. Well, I'm uh, I'm pumped to have you here. You know, you and I are kind of in the similar spot. You know, we're in our 30s. We're, uh, we got some kids. We're trying to figure out what we're supposed to be doing in life. <laughs> yeah. You and I were just yeah. chatting a little bit before uh, before getting on uh, the recording about that. So let, let me learn a little bit about your family. How old are your kids and you know what stage of life are they in? Where are you right now in your life with the kids? Uh, well, I'm in a bit of a transition with my kids. They're, um, they were also little for so long, close together. And, and uh, tomorrow, my youngest son... Uh, turns nine. So I joke it's wow. halfway to 18. He's halfway to an adult, right? I'm mean, even though the adulthood now starts at what, like 26, right, but, uh, so. um, you know, he's halfway to 18. So, you know, I'm in a little different phase now that my kids are 12, 10 and, and, uh, nine or 12, 10, almost, almost 11. Nine. That's cool. Yeah. So, so, um, we're hitting that preteen stage. Uh, it's been a little bit of a transition. You can feel things shift a little bit as a father, uh, when you go from reading them bed, bedtime stories to like, we got to stop playing Fortnite and go to bed, you know, uh. we can't be <laughs> staying up all night. So, uh, yeah, I've been doing this. I've been a single father for, uh, going on six years now. Um, I've been running a household by myself. I split custody. Mm-hmm. And so I got a, my kids half the time and, uh, and we're making it work out, uh, as best as we can. And, and we're having a good time. That's doing it, and, and we really enjoy it. Do you guys do uh, transition on weekends or weekdays? How does that? How does the split? Uh, <laughs> we do. A, it, uh, it's called a five-five-two-two schedule. Five, so five, two, um, five, five, five days me, five days her, two days her, me, two two days her. It's, okay. It, we transitions that works out. So I get we get two nights during the week each every week. So I get Monday and Tuesday night. Yeah. Um, she's got Wednesday, Thursday, and then we alternate the weekends, and so it just works out five-five-two-two. Yeah. Two. It's and been so, that way for the whole time. And so you said it's been six years since that happened. So your your twelve year old was six around that time. Six, then. yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. And how how mm-hmm. was that transition for the kids when they were? I guess they were kind of younger. So I mean, it's. I mean, I guess you can't say that they were younger and they maybe got used to it, but they've been living this way for a little while now. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's pretty normal to them yeah. now. I think. Okay. Um, you know, my youngest has no recollection of what it was like before. Right. And, uh, you know, the older two, every once in a while, they'll, they'll mention something, but it, it's really kind of this is the normal yeah. now. And, and things have been pretty steady and, and the same for so many years. This is just the way it is. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Excellent. So you yeah. talked about that transition from uh, reading them bedtime stories to now them playing, you know, Fortnite and saying, hey, all right, it's time to go to bed. <laughs> what What is the age when I'm going to lose my little boy wanting me to read them bedtime stories? <laughs> um. Well, I don't know. They don't always. They they still want it once in a while, but yeah, yeah mostly it's like, hey, dad, go away. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, for my son, he he hit uh, right around eleven, um, maybe yeah. just before his eleventh birthday. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it it really changed, and they, you know, part of that was just developmental. Like, you know, I think if they hit puberty later, it changes. But he happened to hit puberty kind of young, and and uh, so his mindset changed pretty fast yeah. with the hormones and everything, and. And all that. So uh, my daughter's ten now, just about to turn eleven. So I'm clinging on to it for dear life, man, because I just don't know. Like one day you just wake up and it's like different. You know, yep. you've read it. You've read him the last bedtime story. And you don't realize that was the last day you read him a bedtime story. Like you, you don't even know that it happened, and it just sort of happens. And so somewhere around ten, eleven was was uh, was when it hit. So uh, clinging to it with the other two. That's good. Well, I'll prepare myself. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. that. <laughs> 
<laughs> so you've talked about on your show, which I've had a chance to listen to. I, I really like the conversations Thanks. you're having. Yeah. Um, uh, you've talked about the importance of maintaining your identity separate from being just dad. You know, it's important for us mm-hmm. to be fathers, mm-hmm. but wh- why do you think it's important for fathers nowadays to have a separate identity outside of just being dad? Well, I think in years past, and, and I'm not, not even that long ago, but maybe 50 years ago, it, it was natural for, for fathers to have an identity outside of their kids. It was like a given. You almost had to, or it was accepted. And, and fathers that were deeply involved with their kids' lives was a rarity. Um, when you talk to people in our parents' generation, their dads weren't that involved. <laughs> it was rare if they were involved in the day-to-day. Mm-hmm. And um, so I think that we've progressed in a good way in a lot of ways like I love the fact that I can be very involved in my kids lives and you know and that's definitely changed but you also have to kind of build your own structure around having your own life because your kids you want your kids to look up to what you're doing I mean that's what they learn they learn from people that they respect and you want them to respect you and and, you know the best dads are the ones where the kids are like I want to be like dad Mm -hmm. well if dad is just dad that's hard to be I just want to be like dad because all dad does is like sit there and, and take care of me. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't teach me anything about going out in the world and and doing things and, and and looking forward. So I think it's more, you got to force yourself in today's climate to be a little bit more outward thinking away from your family, uh, teach them to do things and take them out into the world and, and, and kind of get them on that track. And and I think you have to build that sort of structure and you got to have things outside of your, um, family, I think it's great. Men have wanted to devote their lives to their families, but I think it, the balance got off off a little too far, um, you know. And they gave up a little too much of themselves, and you get a little unhappy because you're not doing the things you used to like doing. You know, you're not playing basketball with the buddies, and you're, you know, you're not golfing on the weekends with your friends. And some of that goes away when you have kids, but I, I see it all too often. You just people give up all of it, and and they kind of get miserable, and that's not good for anybody. Sure, yeah, it's a, it's a balance. I, I I completely hear what you're saying. You know, my 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 dad, when um, he was working right out of college, he worked long hours, dedicated his life to the corporate life, and you mm-hmm. know, I I love him for it, and he gave us a lot of opportunity in our lives. But yeah, I mean, what you're describing is that it's very separated. But mm-hmm. as as time has gone on, you know, there's there's sort of that that other mindset of hey, you need to be really involved in your kids' lives and be their <laughs> friends, right? You got to be yeah, their best right. friend. Right. But there's a thought of being the best friend that maybe maybe they don't need a best friend. Maybe they just need a dad. Maybe they need somebody to look up to. So I I, I resonated with that conversation a little bit. That was mm-hmm. that was interesting. Yeah. How, how, how was your relationship with your father as you're growing up? Uh, really good. It, it he was exactly as you described though. He worked sixty hours a week, and right. so. You know, he was gone most of the week. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't see him on the weekdays. And, yep. you know, then I'd see him on the weekend and we do normal father-son stuff, yep. play catch, teach me how to cut the grass, you know, yep. that sort of stuff. But it was it was definitely different. It was not hands-on. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wasn't involved in the day-to-day at all. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember there'd be times when it would be like, my brother and I home with just my dad mm-hmm. and my mom was gone and you know, he, we, we were kind of lost. We were like listless, <laughs> you know, we didn't know how to do the most what are we basic. Supposed to do? <laughs> yeah. Like how do we, what do we do for dinner? Like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. My dad was like, I don't, I don't know. Let's go Taco Bell. I, you know, but um, yeah, it was a great relationship, but, and there was some natural respect there. And, and part of that might've been just the mystery. Cause I, I, I wasn't, um, you know, there wasn't the day to day opportunity to lose that mystique of, of dad's going out into the world. He's making a living. He's providing for us. And, and that was that. Hmm. So it was good. That's very it was good. Interesting. I, I will say I, I've, I have a better relationship as an adult with my father yeah. um, than I did as a kid. And not, there was nothing wrong with my, you know, upbringing by my dad, but it's just that I actually spend more quality time with him now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's retired and, and I, I think we just sit down and enjoy some things together that we didn't do back then. And I didn't appreciate either. You know, we kid, you just want to run out and do stuff. And, you know, dad just wants to sit and watch a ball game with you. And, yep. you know, if you could go back in time and tell your 10 year old self, dude, just sit and watch the ball game with your dad, <laughs> man. you know, don't be in such a hurry to do something else. Yeah. And you probably get like, uh, you know, we were talking about the 60 hour weeks as we're growing up, but you probably get a little bit more personal perspective for what your dad went through, right? you know, is going through not now that we're doing what we're doing as adults <laughs> as well. Right. 
Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I really appreciated my parents fully until yeah. uh, you know my early to mid thirties, yeah. <laughs> and then I then all the responsibility that they were going through, and my kids hit the age when I could remember my own childhood, and I was like, wow, okay, now I now I get it, now I understand, and I I see what they sacrificed for us, and and what they did to make sure we had it, had the right upbringing, and and it's it's you know it's really humbling in a way, Absolutely. and it makes you think back to to the future of my own kids you realize the rewards from being a parent are decades in the making. Mm -hmm. It's not, this is, there's no immediate reward or gratification, um, on a daily basis for this. Uh, they might not appreciate what you're doing for 20 more years. So, so you gotta so buckle the, up. So those kids are gonna, the, the Fortnite players are going to respect you in like 15 years then, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I hope so. <laughs> Let's hope so. You know, as long as I don't let them play too much Fortnite, right, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, cool. Well, we started to touch a little bit about, um, you know, the elements of being a, a, a good dad nowadays. W what do you think those elements are? You know, it sounds like you're thinking it's a balance of keeping your identity as a, as a man, as a father, mm -hmm. but then also, you know, being involved. I mean, where, mm -hmm. where, where do we find that balance? Where do we find the good principles of being a good dad nowadays? Uh, that's a great question because I think that, first of all, I think that you have to create the structure for your kids. Um, kids thrive in structure, uh, structured environment. And, and, and more than ever, are we in a non-structured environment? I mean, it used to be very natural structures. Um, but now it's, it's very difficult to create structure for kids. There's just so much that they can do and, and so much to be involved in and, and so easy to, to kind of just hand them a device and, and, you know, get them out of your hair and, yeah you know, see them when they're 18. I, <laughs> I think that, um, you got to create the structure for them and teach them the ways of disciplining themselves. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to always be the one who has to create the structure. You want to hand that off to them, uh, slowly. And so I look at it from the perspective of, you know, I'm not going to be here to tell you to go to bed at a good time every night, you know, so I can't force you to go to bed every night. You know, I, I, you do when they're little, but at some point you have to like teach your kids to, to, go to bed at a good hour without too much prodding from you. Right. Uh, maybe a suggestion or something. Same with like eating healthier foods, uh, you know, doing your homework before you play, you know, some of that you have to tell a six year old to do, mm -hmm. but when they're 12, you kind of got to start teaching them to do that on their own. Um, you know, the goal is to raise a kid that's going to walk out into the world and, and, and be a fully functional adult, not a, a perpetual adolescent. And so, uh, I think it's our job as fathers to create that discipline uh, in structure, but in a way that you can hand it off and, and teach your kids those routines and things like that, because I think it's lacking a, a great deal. Um, when kids get out into the world, 18, 20, 22, whatever, you know, they start to be on their own. Uh, they need that, that self coping, that ability to self discipline themselves. Mm -hmm. And we can create that for them. Yeah. And, and with that, I mean, do you, do you find, and maybe your kids are too young at this point, but do you find that you're going to be encouraging them to, you know, get some summer jobs as they get a little older into their teenage years, things like that, to, to have that self-discipline and to, to carry that on into uh, their college life? Yeah. You know, I go back and forth about that just because times have changed so much. Yeah. You know, when I was 16, I, you know, it was a given that I was going to go get a job. Right. Right? Like yeah. there was no question about it. I was, you know, if I was going to drive a car, I was going to contribute to the you know, paying yeah. for the insurance uh -huh. and, and doing that sort of thing. So I just went out and got a job. It was yeah. just expected. And, and, um, you know, I, I'm a couple of years away from that. I hope that's the case. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it's a bit different now, you know, kids are not, everybody drives at 16. Right. Like when we were 16, you like, you couldn't wait to get out there. True. Like I was waiting in line at, on my birthday at the, at the, uh, secretary of state's office to get a driver's license <laughs> and be out there driving. But kids aren't doing that as much. Uh, you know, it's not that they don't, but it, that things have just definitely slowed down. I think adolescence seems to go on a little longer mm -hmm. than it used to. And, and, um, I think that I have to base it on maturity level. Um, I think each of my kids will be different. I, I think one of my kids will be, you know, charging at 16 to get a driver's license and moved out by 18. And, you know, I might, might never, you know, <laughs> I might not see him after that, but, uh, you know, other kids would be, you know, they, they don't, they're not even ready to drive a car at 16, Mm -hmm. Um, and they're not maturity, the maturity level is just not going to be there. So I think there's a little bit more in the modern parenting where we're a little bit more cognizant of the differences between kids sure. and we can't parent every kid the same. Yeah. And, uh, so I, my hope is that if they're ready, they get out and get a job. I think putting kids, this is, I always tell this story cause I think 
certain kids aren't, aren't really ready to be out in the workforce. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was 16, I had a job as a bus boy at a restaurant. And, you know, Friday and Saturday night, I'd be busting tables till one o'clock in the morning. And, you know, some of the dudes you're hanging out with when you're busting tables at one o'clock in the morning are not the best dudes. Yeah. <laughs> I remember get, some, some guy, you know, cook or something was like two in the morning. Can you give me a ride home? I'm 16, naive. And I'm like, okay, sure. Yeah, I can give you a ride home. He lived in the you know, the biggest ghetto of Detroit somewhere. Yeah. I'm like 16 year old kid at two in the morning driving through, you know, crack houses in Detroit. And so, you know, <laughs> good thing I was mature and, and, you know, I was, I was, you know, aware of things and kind of realized I needed to get out of that situation, but not every kid's going to be ready yeah, for that and absolutely. to be put in that situation. And so that's what concerns me. Most of these part-time gigs, uh, little fast food places and restaurants and things, you know, you're not hanging out with the best characters all the time. I, I got to be cognizant of that when I send my kid out and uh, make sure they're ready to take that on for six bucks an hour or whatever. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. You're hanging out with a bunch of pot smoking, right. you know, 26 year olds that live in their mom's basement and while they're 16 trying to make eight bucks, you know, <laughs> just got to be aware. Oh, that's funny. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. um, we, we started to talk a little bit about that, that fatherhood identity and, you know, um, you know, going after some things that are exciting to you. You know, I were chatting a little bit before we uh, started recording about, um, you know, diving into this podcast world because it's a lot of fun. Yeah. So why did why did you decide to start the the drink? Uh, and 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 like, what, what is your what is your hope uh, out of that personally? <laughs> uh, we started at Hutton and I. Um, we've been friends from online. We met online a couple years ago, going through you know divorces and things, and met over common ground, and and we became friends. And we would have these talks and conversations, and and we thought, you know, you know what's lacking is a really good show with like two people just talking about the issues of the day and, yeah. and not, not with some big slant or trying to push some political agenda or, or, you know, any of that stuff, uh, you know, or shock radio or just like two dudes who just want to have talk about the issues of the day in like a normal context. And, and, uh, and so we decided, well, what the heck we can record this and, and make it a podcast. And, and we've had a blast, uh, doing it. it. It's really fun. We look forward to it every week. And, and, uh, you know, we both have kids and busy and full-time jobs, but we make it happen. And, and uh, it's really a fun outlet. I, I think one thing that we get out of it is is this connection. I mean, we're in this world where he and I both live in rural areas. It's hard to make a lot of friends. You know, we're not in the areas we grew up in, so we're not surrounded by all our childhood buddies or anything. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so it's that form of connection that goes a little bit beyond just, uh, you know, words on a screen. Yep. And uh, and he and I enjoy that. We we So the goal with the podcast, I think – uh, is eventually to kind of just give the normal take on on the world. You know, things are going crazy. Everybody's polarized. Everybody's going nuts over things left or right. And 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 we're like, can't we just like be normal and just talk and like just talk about cool stuff that we like to do and things that help men make their lives a little better. Um, you know, in subtle little ways. Not like you got to go nuts and do all these different things, but little things that have helped us because we've both been on really um, interesting and and productive journeys ourselves that have turned our lives around and why not share that some of that knowledge with other people and and hopefully get some interesting guests on there too that's great i love it man that's cool and yeah. and, and you you found this as a you know almost like an outlet uh like a a fun outlet while you're doing your nine to five right yeah i think we need something like that right yeah. like um you know we need something to look forward to something interesting i mean you know back in the day guys would hang out in the locker room at the club and yep. like you know and just banter and, and do that sort of thing. And, and, and I think we miss a little bit of that now. Um, and, and we crave it and it's, it's a hobby to look forward to. We pour some time and effort into it uh, to make it as good as we can. And, mm-hmm. and we're always trying to improve and, and build our audience. And, and yeah, it's a fun hobby. It gives you something to look forward to. I think you got to have something to look forward to. It goes back to the first point we made about having something outside of, of just simply coming home and devoting yourself to your family something that's your own it's your own gig it's your hobby or something and little side business whatever you want to call it and, that's cool. and just have fun with it we'll be back to the show in just a moment after a word from our sponsors are you looking for an easy way to manage your money 
The good folks at Tiller are here to help. Tiller is the only tool that automatically imports transactions and balances into Google Sheets. So you can track spending, manage a budget, pay off debt, and grow your net worth. Recently, Tiller released an all-new budgeting system that connects to over 16,000 banks, credit card companies, brokerages, and loan accounts. Their newest features include support for envelope and zero-sum budgeting, the ability to track savings goals, and a more vibrant and easier to understand design. After all, there's nothing better than a beautiful budget. <laughs> if you want more control of your money, you gotta give Tiller a try today. For a 30-day free trial of this versatile budgeting system, go to marriagekidsandmoney.com slash Tiller. That's marriagekidsandmoney.com slash Tiller, T-I-L-L-E-R. With Tiller, you always know exactly where your money goes. Do you have a 401k? Remember how frustrating it was deciding what to invest in without help? Now there's a better way to grow that 401k. Bloom with three O's is a simple, smart, and affordable way to grow your 401k. With Bloom, you can simply connect your existing 401k in a few easy steps. Then sit back and relax while Bloom performs a free, unbiased analysis of the funds in your account and then chooses the best mix to meet your goals while minimizing hidden investment fees. Go online to marriagekidsandmoney.com slash Bloom to get your free 401k checkup now. Bloom is so simple. In fact, actually the hardest part about this is remembering that there are three O's in Bloom. Go to marriagekidsandmoney.com slash Bloom and enter promo code MKM for your first month free and see the difference Bloom can make in your retirement. Thanks for considering our sponsors today, everybody. Let's jump back into that interview. Outside of the work, too. I know you've been vocal about this 40, 50 hour work week. I saw a tweet that you had uh, the other day that, that kind of went viral a little bit about this grind that we all go through being un- unsustainable, you know, emotionally, physically, mentally. Like, what, what do you think? What do you think could be done about that? Do we just need outlets like doing a podcast or getting together with friends in order to keep doing that? Or, I mean, how do you feel about uh, about this way of life that's 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 exist that exists right uh, now? <laughs> this modern way. Don't yeah. get me started on these commuting and. Uh, <laughs> That's my hot button issue is these long commutes and, and things. But I do think I do think, um, you know, it takes you out of I think the modern climate right now is very isolating. Uh, so many people live in in strewn out suburbs throughout these metro areas and they commute lonely in these cars for an hour each way. And, and they sit in these, you know, for less fluorescent lit cubicles. And we're so far from our natural state of, uh, you know, millions of years of evolution. And now we're sitting in fluorescent cubicles not moving and then in little boxes driving down the highway and it's stressful and I think the stress adds up uh, the lack of uh, sensory uh, stimulation adds up I think we you know you need to be outside working with your hands at least a little bit um, you know something to engage your body uh, you know I think a lot of us do the best we can we hit the weight room and and we try to make it work you know these are little like fixes that we try to make work but I I do think the current state is not sustainable. I think people are miserable. Uh, you know, antidepressant use is way up and, and in general, people just seem to be less happy despite being the most wonderfully, uh, prosperous time in history to be alive. Yeah. People generally don't seem any happier or, or more content, uh, than they did in the past. And so, you know, as, as evidenced by people just getting, you know, enraged by everything. And, and why is that? And, and I don't think that this is sustainable. And I think it's a lot of it comes down to meaning and mm-hmm. the meaning. Um, you know, I think a lot of people go into work and, and they might punch numbers on a spreadsheet after driving in a car all day and, and they just don't see the meaning and purpose in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you know, and, and, if your job is disconnected from the end product of whatever it is you're making or your, the widgets your company does or whatever, you don't have any satisfaction going home at the end of the day. And, mm-hmm. and, um, that's why we do things like this. I mean, we, we got to like fill that void somehow. Like I love doing yard work because it's like the one time a week <laughs> I get out and push the lawnmower around. And it's like the one time a week I really feel physically alive. Like I'm in touch with nature and 
I kick back with a cold beer after, at the end of uh, getting the yard all cleaned up, and I feel a sense of satisfaction that sitting in a cubicle in front of a computer screen all day does not bring. Oh, I and, completely uh, agree with you. I mean, yeah. just, even the, the lawn work idea that you're talking about there, especially with the, you know, if you've got office politics or dealing with stuff like that, it's like, all right, yeah. I know that I need to keep this lawnmower straight, and then I turn around and I do it again, and I do it again. <laughs> I'm in control of this moment right now. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's like right, right. everything else is politics aside or the structure yeah. of work. It's like, I got this. <laughs> exactly. And I think ambiguity of the jobs, too. I, I'm a big advocate of, of um, you know, I'm a, I study organizational behavior and, and different things. It's a, it's a big interest of mine, just how people work and the way their minds work. And I think a lot of people are in jobs that are just ill-suited for their personalities and for their, um, you know, different unique traits. And so that builds a low-level tension. And then on top of that, you have mostly ambiguous jobs that don't have a clear outcome. I mean, it was, you know, back in the day when you just put car parts on a car going down the assembly line, at least you knew what you had to do. It was clear. You had to put four bolts on this thing and it would go down the line and you did it right or you didn't do it right. Mm-hmm. Now you got these kind of ambiguous jobs where you're pushing numbers on spreadsheets or building PowerPoints and, and the, the, the feedback loop isn't very clear yeah. and that amb- ambiguity creates stress, yeah. I, I believe. And then you take the stress of the inv- physical environment with the commute and the stress just you're in under this low level feeling of stress for 10, 12 hours a day. And I just don't think that that's good. A lot of people deal with that stress by eating mm-hmm. too much food, you know, uh, binging on tv or alcohol and and different vices like that and and i and i really think that that's a symptom of that we're just not kind of out of our element here yeah no i hear you i hear you well i mean we, we talked about a little bit of i don't know if it's the solution but at least a um a, a dabble in something that might get you excited so you talked about getting outside and get your hands dirty doing some things that are exciting to you doing your podcast creating mm-hmm. something that's different mm-hmm. unique and new and having fun with that do you think that you know Building something like the drink or having more fun as a as a digital entrepreneur could could bring that excitement in your life. Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, it, you, you get excited about it, right? Yeah. There's a feedback loop. Like you go on and see, wow, you know, we had a couple hundred more listeners this week on our podcast, mm-hmm. and and that's that's exciting. Like that's that brings a thrill that that none of the work stuff can bring. You know, not even yeah. a couple extra bucks in the paycheck. You know, it's. A, and um, I think that can fill the void for sure, although I think you got to be careful with the digital side. It's easy to become completely enamored with the digital pursuits because, yep. you know, frankly, those are the things we can fit in our free time usually. Right. Uh, after the kids go to bed, what are we going to, you know, we're not going to be out there, you know, cutting the lawn and stuff. So um, we got to do it with what we have. Yeah. But, uh, but I definitely do think it can fill the void and having some creative pursuit some something you create, whether it's with your hands. Some people are just, you know, predisposed to doing woodworking or right. uh, some type of crafting. This is different. This is my thing. This is what I enjoy to do: is talk to people and and create a digital product that can help people. That's cool. Uh, hopefully, in some way. I like yeah. that. Well, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people are almost stuck in this position that we're talking about too, because the. The pursuit of more, the consumerism society that we're in, has trapped people a little bit in order to have that that mm-hmm. lifestyle. And I, I know I've fell, fallen into that too. You know, you get, you, you get the I've got the small house, and then you get a couple kids, and you got to get the bigger house, and then you got <laughs> the two cars. You get you got the wife because yeah. she's got to go to her job, and and it just starts building and building and building. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. some, some some conversations that have been interesting to me lately, although I'm not. Uh, fully adopting it are you know conversations around minimalism you know less is more what do you what do you think about that that philosophy that that way of thinking uh well that's a great question because this is something I, i'm really passionate about uh and you didn't know that ahead of time which yeah, is cool yeah. uh i discovered minimalism uh, it was probably the first real step i had toward what i would call my self-improvement journey or just in general kind of like figuring out that the traditional way of living just wasn't really for me. I wasn't going to follow the standard path that, that is laid out for everyone. Mm. And, um, discovering the minimalists, I'm sure, I don't know yeah. if you've heard of those guys, yeah. you know, they're pretty popular. They got a documentary on Netflix and I like their podcast um, and I like the movie. Yeah, it was great. I mean, I just, I like to, you know, I, I knew them before they were famous, but oh, cool. I remember uh, discovering them back when the, you know, they had a couple thousand followers and, and they were just getting started out. But, their message resonated with me, and and ever since then I've I've been a um you know what I call what's the right word like an aspiring minimalist yeah um 
it's a little different when you got three kids. Uh, minimalism takes on a different form than if you were like some single dude, 22 years old, you know, uh, it, but I, I do, I, I love minimalism. It, it kind of guides everything I do. Uh, cause back then when I discovered them, I was a big environmentalist. I'm not necessarily not an environmentalist now, but it's just more perspective over time. But, um, you know, I thought, how can I live with less? How can I have less of an impact on this world? And also like how much of my time and energy am I spending dealing with belongings mm-hmm. and things and stuff? And, you know, I had a house just cluttered with things and there's basement filled with stuff that never gets touched and, mm-hmm. and all that stuff. And, and I, I mean, I took on minimalism hard and I haven't, I haven't looked back. Uh, you know, people come over to my house and, you know, my girlfriend will come over and she's like, there's like, it's like Spartan. It's very, <laughs> very, um, empty, but that's just the way it is. That's, I love it that way. Like simple, less things to care for, um, less mind, less physical clutter. I think for me is less mind clutter as well. Um, and, and I'm interested to see how far I can take, I don't want to take it to the extreme, mm-hmm. But I think it also led me to financial breakthroughs in the sense that, you know, if I don't need all this stuff and all the space to take care of, I can live a much different lifestyle. And then I'm not roped, you know, chained to a desk to make my six figures to pay for all of it. Right. What if I just didn't need all of this stuff? Mm-hmm. And so what if I could live on next to nothing? And and then I would discover um, after the minimalists, I discovered the financial side, like Mr. Money Mustache and some of those <clears throat> more famous bloggers. Yep. And uh, then I was like sold. I was like, okay, get my expenses down to the absolute bare minimum that I can get them down to. Um, not extreme, but you know, I could be if I wanted to be. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a I have a term I like to use, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start an endeavor with it. But it's called frugability. Frugability. And I like it. <laughs> frugability. So watch for that. Um, and uh, it's it's this concept that you know. I I can live really cheaply if I need to. Mm -hmm. I don't need to all the time. You know, if I'm making money and things are going well, I can, you know, I can have the nice dinner out and I can go on the vacation and all that stuff. But if everything gets tight or I want to make a job change and take a 50% pay cut, I could too because I've given myself that flexibility to, to be live very low cost. I mean, I've looked at tiny houses. Uh, I've gone that far. The minimalism concept you know, it can get addicting, intriguing. right? It really is. I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued by these tiny houses. Yeah. I mean, if I didn't have kids, I might be living in a tiny house. Right. right now. I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, I just like that concept of not having to worry about things and stuff. I mean, just an example. I just rolled in five minutes before this podcast started. I got home from work and to come into a house that's like pretty Spartan. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to worry about anything. I don't have to like a bunch of tasks to take care of. And yep. my house is 1,200 square feet. There's four of us here. Um, there's not much extra space. We just use everything to the max. Yeah. Um, we buy just what we need. I just have, you know, I, I use two coffee cups, <laughs> um, over and over and over again. I've had them. It's like my little trusted friend. You know, I, I have this, this mug I've been using for 10 years and it's great. You know, um, I, I just, I just love minimalism. Has, I, has that I, affected I your wardrobe on. as well? Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, <laughs> All of my clothes are are on one little rack in my closet. I love like it. everything is in one little tiny. It could fit in one of those little tiny bedroom closets that it needed cool. to. You know, I got a walk in, but I use half of it for an office. Yeah. Um, in my walk in little writing desk in there, and the other half is just my clothes. And and uh, yeah, it makes everything easier. I did, I just can't say enough about minimalism. I, I I'm so thankful that started me down the path of, you know, maybe I don't need to follow the the path. And that was key to me. It wasn't so much the minimalism, but it was like the permission to not live like this consumerist life, lifestyle that straps you to debt, straps you to a, a job you don't like to pay for it all. Absolutely. And and then the wheel just keeps spinning and, and it taught me so many things. Well, it's, it's an exciting cycle to get into. But you said, like oh. you said, like... You, you can get into it, man. You can get really oh. into it, and I've and I've gone down that path too. Whether Have it's you, okay. minimalism or or uh, just financial independence in general, I get all jacked up about these things. <laughs> I was and then, say, I saw some tweets from you about frugality and yeah. Mr. Money Mustache. Did you did you really go that far? Well, so what no. I do is I get really excited about things, and then I yeah. don't actually check in with my wife to see if she's interested, <laughs> and then I just start doing them, and then she's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait I, a second. I, yeah. I gotta say here too, but so but you know, I mean and. and it's a good balance between her and I because 
I would probably live in a tiny home or a cardboard box or something like that, <laughs> yeah, and it, wait, would, it would wait. affect it would affect our family life. So she brings me back yeah. into reality sometimes, it's which good. is which is good, which is good. I'm sure it's, your kids do the same thing. How did your kids uh, adopt the the uh, minimalism uh, path with you? Are, are they uh, fighting it? Are they down with it? What, what, what how do they feel? Um, I think they like it. I, you know, my kids are, and some of it is motivated by the fact that I have, um, my little son has ADHD and, mm-hmm. and one of the things that I noticed about his attention span is when things get cluttered, he kind of loses it. Mm-hmm. Like you just can't pull, hold it together when there's yeah. a lot of chaos and noise. And so I keep it very Spartan in some ways for him, you know, it helps him be calm. And, and I think the kids don't even notice, like I don't even use the word minimalism. The kids really don't notice. I just keep, they they kind of like what we do, (laughs) right. They will say things like, dad, you're so OCD. Cause I'm always like making sure everything's like picked up, you know, (laughs) like I like my table clear, my counter clear, you know, things like that. And when we leave the house, it's gotta be all clear. I don't want to come back to a mess. And, uh, so a little bit of is they kind of joke about OCD, but they don't, they don't seem to mind too much. And I think maybe some of that is just that they're at the age now where most of their stuff is electronic, you know, their, their wants and needs like an iPad is, you know, it's pretty minimalist because it doesn't take up much space and it's hours and hours of entertainment. Whereas when they're four and they got little toy trucks everywhere and stuff, it's harder uh, to be a minimalist, but, uh, yeah, they don't they don't really fight it, but I also it's one of those things if I made a big deal out of it, they might fight it just because I'm making a big deal out of it, right? <laughs> it would <laughs> be like fight Dad, on. Dad <laughs> you and this stupid minimalist stuff. Why you keep taking all my stuff? But I just don't say anything. I just keep very little things in the house and they That's don't good. seem to mind. So. I like it. I like it. Well, yeah. it's, they're bring, you're bringing them up in their way of life. I mean, even outside of minimalism, I mean, we were talking about the the 9 to 5 way of life. Do do you think that uh you want to encourage your kids to you know, pursue entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurship and like think outside of you know working on the cube. Um, again, I think it comes down to personality. Yeah, like we talked about. Yeah, I, I really, I really think some people are cut out for the entrepreneur, mm-hmm. and some people thrive under the structure yeah. of of the nine to five. I just really, I think there's people I've met that would just be uh, a fish out of water if they yeah. didn't have their nine to five That's and right. their gig and their routine. And as my kids grow, I'm very um, conscious of their personalities. And I, you know, I can tell you, um, I won't say which ones cause they might listen to this someday, <laughs> but you know, I can tell you that, that there'll be two of my kids that are going to thrive outside of the nine to five and, you know, will will uh, crave a little bit more independence. And then one will be, you know, perfectly aligned in a, in a good rigid structure of, of a job. And, and, um, so I'll encourage them based on their personality to just find what works for them. Um, cause I think you can go both ways. I mean, forcing somebody into a nine to five that just wasn't meant to be there yeah. it, it is going to be miserable and forcing somebody to try and make it on their own. Who just doesn't have that intuition to go out there and, and, and pull together the ideas or they're, maybe they're pretty introverted and, and yeah. they're, you know, the sales and stuff required and an entrepreneur, uh, might not be the thing for them. And so, uh, again, I think it's, I think it's just finding what's right for your personality and understanding it and, you know, it goes along with this whole culture thing. I think we get a little off track talking about the whole just be yourself thing. But I think there's some validity to the fact that you got to find what works for you and your personality. And, and otherwise, you're going to live with this constant tension uh, that something's off and you're not in alignment with what you need to be doing. It doesn't mean everything's going to be great and fun all the time. You know, sometimes you got to do things you hate. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to hate some things. And if you're you like nine to five, you're going to hate some things. Absolutely. So just is what it is. Yeah. It's all about balance. And, and like you said, um, you know, doing what's right for you. I, I completely yeah. agree with you. So yeah. uh, are you reading any books lately that are exciting you uh, on the, on all these paths we're talking about? I mean, we covered oh, everything man. today. Anything that's exciting you lately? Uh, um, I, I get through a lot of audio books on my commute because my commute's an hour each way yeah. right now. And, and, uh, I've been cranking out the audio books uh, I've, I've been reading a couple by CJ DeMarco. Uh, one's called the millionaire fast lane. Uh, and the other one is called unscripted and, and unscripted really spoke to me. Um, you know, I, I'm a restless, I call myself a restless cube dweller. I, I think I'm an entrepreneur at, at heart, but I've been kind of stuck in the cube. Um, you know, I haven't shared this too much, but you know, I've dug my way out of debt twice. Um, you know, deep holes. Uh, I dug my way out when I was married and we, you know, we kind of started our marriage with a bunch of debt and did the whole crazy honeymoon thing and paid for a bunch of daycare when we couldn't afford and, um, got in a big hole, dug ourselves out. Then I got divorced, which dug a new hole by itself. Uh, and then I dug myself out over the next five years and got back to level again. And, 
And so, um, you know, I haven't really had a chance to think about doing anything different career wise than what I've been doing. It mm-hmm. just, you know, it's nine to five pays the bills and good at it and it's fine, but that's not really been where I want to really sink my teeth into and, and gets my blood flowing. And so, Reading Unscripted by C.J. DeMarco has been really eye-opening. It's a, you know it's a good look at entrepreneurship. Um, you know it's a little bit. Every book I take, you know, the perspective of the author into account, right? Like he hit it big on a on a software idea and made his millions. Well, he's not an expert in everything, right? He, right. he got he he did good. He put himself in a position to get rich um, on an idea, which is which to be fair, that's what he says in the book is like, I can't tell you how to get rich and, you know, hit it big as an entrepreneur, but I can tell you, you're not going to do it unless you put yourself in the position to do that. Sure. Um, and, and allow for that to happen. So that's a good one. Um, uh, the Taleb, uh, I always forget. I can't, uh, Asim Nicholas Taleb, I think is how you say his name, but, okay. uh, skin in the game, hmm. uh, was fantastic. I love that book. Uh, it really made me think about, it's part of the reason even I'm here talking to you right now is, you know, putting my face out there a little bit more, putting myself on the line a little bit more. He talks about just, you know, if you're going to do anything meaningful, you, what's in it, what's the downside for you? Uh, and I love that premise. You know, if you're going to make a difference, there has to be a downside for you yeah. uh, to, to, to do it. And so you have to put yourself out there and take the risk and put yourself out for criticisms and, and things like that. And so Taleb was good. Uh, Jordan Peterson's 12 rules for life, uh, was, was, a spectacular book as well. I've been a big Jordan Peterson fan for a long time. And, and when his book came out, that really, um, got me excited. Good, good book on, on just sorting yourself out. He says, sort yourself out over and over. We say that in our podcast, uh, <laughs> the drink, we start our podcast every episode with how sorted we feel on a scale of <laughs> zero to 10. And, and uh, we kind of got that from Jordan Peterson. So, That's um, cool. So those have been good ones. We yeah, those are the four most recent ones I, nice. I've done. Uh, and then the uh, Napoleon Hill uh, Think and Grow Rich. Yeah, I think it, it's is classic. a staple. I I read that a few months back, and and uh, I think that no wonder it survived seventy years yeah. and still relevant today. It's just phenomenal. Unbelievable. Yeah. No, so, I, and that, that's that's a positive with a long commute. Then I know you don't like the commute, but you get you get to yeah you get to grab a oh. lot of good knowledge there. <laughs> I know, and, and the likelihood that I would have spent that hour at home reading is pretty slim. Pretty so, minimal, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, right. So it's probably good. I probably read more books because of that commute than than I ever would have dreamed of doing. Although, you know, I wonder how much the the recall is the same when you're driving. You sure. can't take notes. You can't, you know, kind I of agree. thing. But yeah, I mean, I'm able to consume more because of the audiobooks. Yeah, but. I've 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 found that over the past couple of years where I'm like, hey, I want to read more, but mm-hmm. is it the amount of reading that's the positive thing, or is the amount of action you're taking from from reading one book or the right. books, you know? And I don't know what the right answer is. I'm still figuring I'm, it out myself. I'm a terribly <laughs> slow reader. Like when I read print books, oh, I'm yeah. off. I'm awful. I read, you know, my girlfriend can read a book in three hours, and I'm like on <laughs> page thirty. You know, like, what are you doing? I'm like I don't know. I just read really Drift slow. Off. Or I like, do it at I night. I'll fall asleep right yeah. away. I'll like read like yeah. one page, and I'm like, boom. <laughs> oh, I can't. I can't read at night. I have to read something light at night that I don't care about because I'm just gonna fall asleep anyway. But, but when I read nonfiction, I tend to like really absorb it yeah. and think it through. So I read a page and I kind of think about it, and I I really want to get something from it. I don't just want to read it over. And I, I'm afraid that's what happens a little bit with the audio books is you kind of get the main gist, uh, but you don't really get to get absorbed deeply right. some of the some of the stuff and so it's uh it's still better than wasting an hour in the car that's right uh pull some things <laughs> from it and podcasts podcasts are great right oh yeah you know, i'm loving yeah. podcasts right now i've it's been so. been huge for me the reason i started this one is just because i was listening to him and i'm like hey that looks like fun i think it's i'd like best, to do that. this is fun I, I do love this you can't beat this well speaking yeah. of podcasts where can people find your show and then where's the best place for them to follow you um the uh, best place to find me is on Twitter. I'm mostly just on Twitter right now. Um, Real Mark B33 is my handle there. Um, and the Drink Podcast is on. Um, if you look up the Drink, it's on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, you know all those major players there, or, or it's uh, thedrink.libsyn.com, L-I-B-S-Y-N.com, is the the homepage for the show. Uh, yeah, we got about ten episodes out there and. And I hope you give it a listen. It's it's a really fun show. Well, I've been enjoying it a lot. So keep doing what you're doing. Good. Man. Thanks and, for listening. Um, absolutely, absolutely. I love I love real conversations. I wanted to have a real one with you today. So thanks yeah. for uh, thanks for joining, man. 
Hey, thanks for having me on. That was a refreshing, candid, and open chat. It was great. I can pl- I can completely relate with Mark's current position in life. He's searching for what's next, what's more than just the nine to five, and discovering who he wants to be, not only for himself, but for his kids too. Mark's taking a break from the drink podcast, FYI, but he is having some fun conversations on Twitter at Mark Allen Bover. So check him out and connect with him. Here are my top three takeaways from my chitty chitty chit chat with Mark today. Number one, don't just be mom or dad, be you. Sometimes I find myself working so hard to be a present father, quote unquote, or give my kids my all, quote unquote, that I just forget that it's okay just to be me and uh, to have my own life. It's okay for me to follow my passions, my hobbies, my interests. In fact, it's not only just okay, it's probably great for my kids to see that I am more than just dad. I'm a runner. I like coaching couples with their money. I'm a volunteer. I like karaoke jams. And I love, 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 love taking naps. <laughs> I want my kids to see, know, and understand all of these things about me so they understand who dad is. And the same goes for you out there, you super mom or you super dad. If you're looking for permission to enjoy some time with your friends or play the guitar or just simply have a nice craft beer. Congratulations. You've earned it. Go get it. And when your kids see your independence and this and your self-love, what you're that you're giving yourself, they'll they'll become confident little people too. So put your oxygen mask on first and take a deep breath. Number two. Don't let your bummer day job define you. If you're not inspired by the job you have right now, but you need the money and benefits to take care of your family, find another outlet that brings you joy. For me, I like my job, but I'm not jumping out of bed every morning to go go to work. (laughs) But this podcast, on the other hand, has gotten me all jacked up every morning for the past 18 months. And that is my thing. That's the thing that gets me going. Uh, do I need to be in love with my job? I, I think it's okay if I'm not. But podcasting might not be your thing, but find out what does. Find out what jacks you up. Find out what gets you going. And if you don't know, try something new. Try some biking, some running, some music, some arts and crafts, writing, some sort of creative endeavor. You'd be amazed about how much brighter your day becomes when you're excited to start your hobby, to start your passion, to start your interest. Now, if your day job is horrible and toxic and you really hate it, I'd I'd look for somewhere else to go, but that's just me. But if you're just not loving it, perhaps you just need a hobby that lights you up at the end of the day or in the morning before you go. It's it's really fun to have another identity outside of parent and full-time worker. I'll, I'll tell you that, guys. It's, it's, it's been a lot of fun for me. Number three, embrace minimalism. Minimalism can be a fun challenge, and it helps reduce clutter, stress, and it can be a great example for your kids. My wife, Nicole, has been doing the minimalist thing before it was a fad. She's, <laughs> she's loved a clean house, loved an orderly house ever since we got married back in... 2010. And now she's doing it as a uh, as a professional, a professional organizer. She's doing it for a living. The way she's kept our home designed and organized has honestly helped me live a less stressed life and it just makes it a joy to come home each day. And it's rubbed off on me too. Each quarter I go through my closet and get rid of the clothes that I don't wear or the electronics that I'm not using anymore or books that I don't need anymore, and we sell them on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace, or we give them away. It's cleansing. It feels good. If you feel like your house is adding to your stress, 
see if you can live with less. Less clothes, less boxes, less storage, less decisions. It may just do the trick. Whew. I feel motivated already. I think I'm going to go do some summer cleaning today or this week. <laughs> It really is cleansing, my friends. So those were my top three takeaways. Number one, don't just be mom or dad, be you. Number two, don't let your bummer day job define you. And then number three, embrace minimalism. What do they say? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is kooky craziness. So let's take this opportunity to spice up our lives and pursue our passions. And if you don't know what those passions are, there is no better day than today to figure it out. Experiment, test, and have some fun with it because your kids are watching. Now it's time to announce the Money Master of the Week. I connected with Jess from Florida about how her and her husband, Josh, paid off $147,000 of debt in just three years. Whoa. I discovered Jess and Josh's story as I was scrolling through Twitter the other day. Here are the high-level details of this big monumental victory. They racked up $147K in student loans, car debt, Bedroom furniture loans and credit card debt. Ouch. 140K, 147K. Ouch. Figuring everyone just sort of lived with massive debt, they let it fester for a while until they met a couple in their area that had retired early. And they were so inspired by this couple, by this financially independent couple, that they wanted in. The debt pay down started right away in 2015, and with their combined $95,000 income, they started tracking their income and expenses with a zero-based budget. They started living well below their means, and then slowly but surely, they chipped away at that debt each month. Three years later, in May of this year, May 2018, they became debt-free. This is how it's done, my friends. When you clean up your debt, you feel free. Now these two are all excited about pursuing financial independence, and they're moving towards it, man. Talk about true freedom. If you want to learn more about Jess and Josh, I will link to a time.com article that features these two winners. Jess, thanks so much for connecting with me on Twitter and congratulations for being our Money Master of the Week. Do you have a recent financial victory that you want to share on this show? Shoot me a note at andy at marriagekidsandmoney.com or leave me a voicemail at marriagekidsandmoney.com slash voicemail. I would love to hear from you and get inspired. You'll find all the links and resources for today's show at marriagekidsandmoney.com slash session 93. My friends, I just got back from an excellent conference called Podcast Movement in Philly. And by the way, Philly is a really cool city. I got to run the art museum steps like Rocky, you know, when he goes up those steps. And then he gets up there and then he uh, puts his hands up in the air and says, yeah. So I did that. It was a lot of fun. Anyway, at the conference, I learned a lot about being a better podcaster, how to be a better host, better storyteller, and just essentially just to give you a better show. So with that said, I want to ask you, yes, you, what do you think of this show? What should I be doing more of? What should I be doing less of? In short, I want your feedback. I threw this out on Twitter and Facebook, and so far I've got some positive feedback and then some suggestions as well. Number one was to make sure I'm uh, connecting with more unique guests instead of ones that have appeared on other financial podcasts. They don't like seeing the same uh, roster of folks on show after show. So very cool. Uh, I get that. I'll be working on that. Number two would be um, continue to ask out-of-the-box questions to keep it more fun, keep you know, keep keep spicing it up. Don't just ask the same things um, that uh, people might be interviewed on other shows about. 
And then number three, which I thought that was, was funny is to um, include my daughter more because people like her personality. <laughs> so more Zoe and she's not camera shy or micro show, microphone shy. So I'm, I'm not worried about that. That shouldn't be a problem. So anyway, if you have any other feedback, I really appreciate hearing from you again. Email Andy at marriagekidsandmoney.com or voicemail marriagekidsandmoney.com slash voicemail. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. In the spirit of growth and inspiration, I'm going to end the show with a quote today from Germany Kent. Don't live the same day over and over again and call that a life. Life is about evolving mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. There's no better day to make a change than today, everyone. Carpe diem! 